In 1972, there was a Hawaiian Senate representative by the name of Patsy Mink who had a strong conviction. We've got a picture of Patsy here for you. And she was on the t- cover of Time magazine because of this thing that was started as a conviction that she decided to take it all the way through and pass a bill at Congress, which is now known as Title IX. If you're familiar with college athletics, what Title IX basically says is that every time there is a scholarship given to a male athlete, an equal amount must be allocated to female athletes as well. And this was a huge step forward in some equality for both men's and women's sports at the collegiate level. But something interesting that happened as a result. Because you have these powerhouse football programs that have 53-man rosters, and there's really no uh, female sport that kind of has the same sheer just quantity of athletes, it started uh, creating this thing called stowaway sports. And what a stowaway sport is, is that these female, uh, 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 these women's sports would kind of create these roster spots that were kind of above and beyond, not really needed for what was actually decided to play. And so certain sports became kind of known as stowaway teams, those that were kind of, kind of off the public radar, fencing, water polo, certain track and field events, and rowing. Now, this might sound familiar to you because in 2019, the infamous Lori Laughlin of Full House, how many of you guys were Full House people growing up, right? Or Fuller House for the young crowd, okay? And Lori Laughlin decided to take advantage of this stowaway system in which she kind of met this agent who said, hey, you want your kids to go to the prestigious USC, University of Southern California? She said, absolutely, but they can't get in. They don't have the skills, the grades. He says, all I need is a half a million dollars. That's it. Cool, smooth, 500K. And we'll get you into one of these uh, stowaway programs. And so they decided to label her daughters as rowing athletes, even though they had never picked up an oar one day in their entire life. Laughlin was eventually caught. She was sentenced to two months prison and hundreds of thousands of dollars more in fines. All of that to fake being a rowing team member to get into the school of their hopes and dreams. Now, perhaps you're familiar with that story, and you're like, Eric, man, I would never do something like that. And let me tell you, I would never do something like that either, because I don't really have an additional $500,000 just lying around to spend on it. But you and I can kind of say, man, that's a little extreme, kind of going to that level to fake something. But the root truth of the matter is you and I have probably faked something at some time or another, Right? Maybe you faked being sick to get out of a test. Maybe you faked being sick to not go to church when you were little. Maybe you faked being sick to not have to go to work someday. Like, I just feel like we fake being sick a lot. It is what it is. But faking is sometimes a natural, real part of our lives. And if we're not careful, we don't think two thoughts about it. There's actually a a new company. It's a legitimate website called fakeavacation.com. And here's what it is. For just the smooth 40 bucks, they can Photoshop you into a popular vacation spot that you've always dreamed to go to. Let me give you an example. Say you want to go to Paris and spend time at the Eiffel Eiffel Tower. All you do is they send you some some poses and then they Photoshop you in to those infamous places, whether it's Paris, maybe you're going to go to Egypt and visit uh, the, the pyramids, wherever it is, but it gets better. As a result, they will send you a packet of talking points so that you can literally talk as if you went there in the first place. This is a true story. There's also this thing called InstaJet where you can rent a private jet that never leaves the ground to sit on it for about an hour at a time while someone comes and takes professional portraits of you to kind of give the appearance that you have that lavish, luxurious lifestyle that so many crave to, to project on social media. See, when it comes down to it, one of the greatest temptations we have in life is to fake our way through it. Think about that for a moment. Think about the things that you have probably faked your way through at some time or another. Could be small things, could be big things. But if we're not careful, the idea of, it's, okay, I can, I can fake my way through this is usually a desire to uplift ourselves above all else. And sometimes it creeps its way into our faith in Jesus as well. We just think, you know, life's hashtag YOLO, let's just kind of get through it. But we forget that we are more than ourselves and there is a greater purpose beyond you and I as our individualistic nature to live for. 
And so as we continue our study in the book of James, I'll invite you to turn with me there to James chapter, uh, we'll be in James chapter four and five today. And James uh, has been this great book for us. It's found in the, Old, uh, the New Testament. You go all the way to the right in the Revelation, make your way all the way to the left a few books, and there you'll find James. If you're following along with us, you can always uh, take out your sermon notes that you can grab when you're grabbing communion as well as on the app as well. And we've talked about every single week this main idea about what the book of James is about. And it's that our faith is only as legitimate as it's expressed. That if you ever want to know if your faith is real or valid or if your faith is vibrant and alive, look at how it's expressing itself out. And we started in in week one talking about when we face trials or wounds of this life. How do we respond to those as a great marker of faith? We talked about how our works and how our faith is supposed to lead us to action and not just sitting idly as someone who claims to be a Christian. We talked about how our words last week have important value to show that the faith in Jesus is transforming our hearts. And today, we're going to look at the dichotomy between God's will and our will when it comes to following Jesus. James says this, James, the half-brother of Jesus, continues picking up in verse 13. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do it and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now, upon reading that passage, some of us might get a little uh, skeptical. We get maybe hyperventilate. Oh, is James saying it's bad to have a business plan? It, it sounds like he's kind of saying it's bad to invest money. It's kind of bad to project into the future what we want to do uh, in, in the company that we work for. Is he saying that that's a sin, that that's wrong to do? And the answer is, well, yes and no at the same time, too. You see, it's not a knock on investing. It's not a knock on strategic business planning. But notice what James says, who you forgot. That should have been a big part of your plans. You said, you go here and you will do this and you will make that. You forgot one big person to be involved. And that is the Lord. You see, James is using this predicament that they found themselves in as a stark reality to consider the direction of your life. He's saying, if you can't even plan for the future, which you have no control over, hoping that God will be present and intervene, then whose will are you actually following in life? He's kind of setting everyone up to say, those who say they will go there and do this and make this amount of money, he's putting it at our inability to control the events of tomorrow. Who do you believe, James is saying, is actually in control of what happens day after day after day? You know, it always reminds me of that scene from Back to the Future, right? And he takes that first trip, he grabs that sports almanac, and he has that realization, the Cubs win the World Series. It's that same thing. We have zero control over what happens tomorrow. And he follows it up with this really stark reminder. He says, let me remind you, you are but a mist, he says, a puff of smoke, a vapor. It harkens back into the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything is hebel. Everything is full of a void and hard to find meaning. Everything's but vapor and smoke. Now the thing is, is James is not saying you are worthless. James is not saying your life is completely meaningless. Rather, it's a simple reality check. Why put so much stock into your will? Why put so much stock into your ways? Why put so much stock into your stuff when you can't control tomorrow any more than you have the ability to control the stock market? All while saying, I will go about life claiming to be a follower of Christ but leaving him behind. He's saying, be careful of how you think you can fake your way through this faith thing. And therein lies the great temptation of our, of our passage today, is living for our will over God's will. YOLOing our way through life, always putting number one above everyone and everything else no matter what. And the heavy reminder is from James. He's saying, God is in control, really. But also don't forget that life is really short. 
It's almost as if I think we could sum it this way. He's saying make decisions based on eternity. Make decisions based on eternity. You see, without God, it's not to say that your plans are going to fail. But without God, your plans will never be enough. I think that's what he's leading us for. Go ahead and make all the plans that you want. Make all the money that you can. Make everything as best as you can and try really, really, really hard. And if it works out for me, you might actually succeed. But at some point, it's not going to be enough. He's not saying it's bad to make money. He's not saying it's bad to have a business plan. He's saying don't forget to include God amidst it all. Let me give you this illustration that kind of reminds me of this. I don't remember where I first saw it, so I can't take the credit or give credit where it is. But let's just imagine that this rope represents all of human history, right? Here's the beginning of it all. God creates and and life ends, and then somewhere probably around here is Adam and Eve, and then uh, we get uh, Noah and the flood and everything, and then we go through the Old Testament, and Jesus is probably around here somewhere, and we go all the way. Oh, and then then we keep going and going and going and going and going. Oh, Oh, here's us. Okay. All right. You guys see this tiny little blue spot? Probably not. Like, let's see. I'll hold up the camera right there. That's us. This tiny little blue speck. Let's just imagine this is us. Okay. And he's saying everything that we do and have and make is confined to this itty tiny little blue spot. There's thousands of years that have happened before us. There's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of years, potentially. I can't, I don't see the future. I don't know, but could quite possibly exist after us. And he is saying, is like, well, okay, you guys can pretend to control everything. You little people in this little blue speck, you're so cute, and you make all your plans, and you go about life. And he's saying, yeah, what about the God who can literally do this? What about the sovereign creator of the universe who literally does this? Holds time in his hands. Holds it all up to say, this is mine. I created this. Who should you kind of make sure is involved in your life? Whose will are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the will of little blue speck you and say, well, what I can know and see and understand in this here little spot, man, this is the most important thing I could do. Or are you going to follow the God who does this? Day after day, week after week, moment after moment, God stands outside of time to say, I have no beginning, I have no end, and there is no limit to my power and my understanding. You don't even know what comes tomorrow, James says. And you've forgotten to include the God of the universe who holds all of time in his hands. We got caught in this trap so much to focus on the little tiny blue speck that we forget everything else that comes with eternity. And so I think this is where those sins of omission come from, right? Kind of a weird thing. He's talking about business and making money and having God's will. And he slides in, James says, and also if you know the good you ought to do and forget to do it, you know, that's a sin. It's like, that's kind of a weird spot to play it in. Or is it? Think about the good things you know you ought to do. Think about the God honoring things you know you ought to do. Think about the kingdom minded things that God calls you to do. I would venture to guess if you are like me, whenever we don't do those things, it's because we're focused on this instead of this. That we make decisions based on the temporary, on the earthly, instead of the eternal. Our sins of omission more often than not probably come because we have a perspective that's confined to the tiny blue spot opposed to everything that God is holding together. And so it begs the question, well, what is God's will for my life? Perhaps you've asked that before. Or maybe you're here today trying to figure that out and ask it for the first time. It's a big question. It's a great question. And James, though, is kind of saying, he's like, kind of no. Yet you've forgotten to put it into motion. I think some of us, we ask that question genuinely. God, what is your will for my life? Because I want to obediently follow it. At the same time, too, I think some of us use that question as a way to kick down the curb the call of obedience. Well, until I really figure out God's will for my life, then, I, then, I'll, then I'll be more generous. Once I really find out God's will for my life, then I'll kind of treat people different. Well, once I really kind of find out and figure out God's big old plan and will for my life, well, well, then I'll get involved in church or I'll use my spiritual gift. I think some of us, we ask that question genuinely we want to know. Others of us, we use it as a scapegoat. Like imagine for a moment, uh, you were on a basketball team and, and you were just kind of riding the bench. And you went up to coach, you said, coach, you know, started dating this girl. She really wants to see her boy in the game. 
And uh, so, so what do I got to do to get some more playing time? And coach says, well, if you show up early, you work hard, and put the team first, you'll get in the game. Yeah, but coach, you know, like, but, you know, I really, like, I, I got some other stuff to do, and so I can't really come early. And, uh, like, when you say, like, try hard and, and work hard, what do you really mean? He's like, give it, give it 110%. Every drill, every practice, every game. You can, well, yeah, but, you know, sometimes, like, I'm a little tired. And, 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 and he said, okay, well, just, just, just run the offense that I call. Well, but, yeah, but can I kind of, like, show off the skills that I got? Can I, can I give a little juice and show the crowd what I've got? And he's like, show up early, work hard. And run the offense. Yeah, but coach, you know, you don't really really mean that, right? Uh, You don't really mean that, like, that's how I'm going to get in the game. Can't I just, you just slide me in for a couple minutes and I show everyone what I got, right? And then everyone's kind of clapping and cheering and going along. I don't have to, like, actually be on time for practice. And he just probably says, show up early, work hard, run the offense. I think it's the same thing for us when we're trying to follow God. God, what's your will for my life? I'm here, I'm asking, I want to know, like, like, what you got? And God's like, love me, love others, serve both. But, like, I don't really, like, have to love you, like, all the time, just, like, on Sundays for an hour, like, love me, love others. Yeah, yeah, but God, but, like, you know, like, there's a lot of stuff going on in my life. Can I just kind of put you off to the side for a little bit till I got some stuff figured out? Love me, love others, serve both says you're a mist you're here today gone tomorrow in the grand scheme of things don't cling to this life so closely when you can cling to the sovereign creator of the universe who holds everything together James continues in chapter 5 verse 1 he says now listen you rich people For those of you who your name is rich I'm sorry you probably kind of feel a little extra offense during this passage but we move on He says, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat their flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. God's will, I will tell you, is not complex. It's not. It's to pursue him in all that you do. Relationships, finances, work, raising your children, going about your day, sharing the good news. God's will is not complex. It is simple to pursue him. But with that comes the call to surrender everything to Jesus. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow me. To obediently follow where the spirit leads us. And James though says, you want to practically know if you can do this well? He says, show me the money. Show me the money. And we could go beyond. It's not just saying about do you give to the church or not. What do your words look like? What are your actions? When you have the opportunity to lift someone up instead of tear them down, do you take it? When you have the opportunity to reach out to someone because the Spirit has led and prompted you, do you take it? With everything that you are, do you love God with it or do you follow your will? But very specifically, James is writing to his readers here and thus to us. He says, your statements make a statement. It wouldn't take long if we sat down and you showed me your your credit card statements, your debit card. If you still have a checkbook, I don't know how to read one of those, so I'd be a little lost. But be really quick to easy to probably figure out where some of your priorities lie in life. Where your money goes makes a statement. And James says in verse 15, so don't be like the fattened cattle, right? What he's talking about is these cattle who are getting every rich and glorious gluttonous thing given to them. And they're getting fatter and fatter. And they're like, life is great. Nom, 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 nom. More food, more whatever. I don't know what you feed cows. More grass. I don't know. Give me all the good stuff. And you're just, nom, 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 nom. and they said, bro, they're fatting you up to kill you. Don't be so just consumed with the glorious and the riches and what you have in this life because you're going to die. And he says, be careful. Human. It's the same thing. He says, riches rot. Riches rust. 
You say, well, Eric, I'm not rich. <laughs> I never won the lottery. Joke's on you. There's actually a man by the name of uh, Bill Morgan. He's an Australian man. Get this story. It's crazy. Um, who was in a car accident, a pretty severe car accident, was in a coma for 14 days. Okay? He wakes up, feeling kind of lucky to be alive, decides to kind of test his luck. So he goes to the local convenience store, gets a $5 scratch off, scratches it off first try, wins $18,000. And people are like, whoa, that's kind of cool. Like, you know, it's not as much as like the Powerball or something like that. The news catches wind of this and they say, hey, can we do a story about this? Like, it's not so much that you won $18,000. I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. That's a big deal. But it was like you were in a car accident and now you're alive. And then the first thing you did was he says, great, so cool. So they pick him up, they take him to a convenience store and they say, can you go in there and buy a scratch off? And so we can kind of just film it and reenact it. Kid you not. He gets a scratch off, another $5 scratch off as he scratches it off, he wins another quarter million dollars. <laughs> Incredible, right? Man, this guy went from being like basically dead three weeks prior to having 250000 plus $18,000 together. I, math, whatever that is. And you say, well, Eric, you know, I'm not like Bill. I haven't won the lottery once, let alone twice. I'm not rich. You know, the average person in the entire world lives on $2 or less. Let me say that again. The average person in the entire world lives on $2 or less. James is not throwing around a word of caution about wealth in and of itself. He's saying be careful of the stronghold it may have on your heart. He said of riches rot, rust, rot, and riches rust. And it's what reigns supreme in your heart. It sits on the throne of your heart. Guess what's going to happen to your heart as a result? See, money is the one master that's more fickle than the rest because as soon as you get it, it's going a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the challenge is so strong and direct. He says, why hold so tightly to the things of this life? Why hold so tightly to what you feel like you can control, but you really can't, and you completely ignore the God who does this? Why put so much focus on the will of your world or your ways that it's hoping, trying to make this speck a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, when the whole entire God of creation has invited you into his life? Be warned, he says. Well, hold up, pastor. You tell me this, Sherlock, then. How am I supposed to pay my bills? I got a mortgage. I got kids to feed. How am I supposed to make a living without it ruining my life? The big issue is not the money or the wealth in and of itself. It's the heart and integrity behind it all. It's not how dare you make a business plan, James says. He's saying, you made a business plan, but you left God out in the midst of it. It's not where do you get off making a good living. It's you made a good living by oppressing your workers saying money has got such a good soul grip on you, your life, that has led you to make a string of poor decisions along the way. So is is it wrong to make money? Hear me say this. No, it is not. Is it wrong to make money and pay your employees poorly? Take advantage of them. 100% yes, it is. Is it wrong to have a business plan? No, it's not. Is it wrong to place your trust and security in life and in money and your abilities alone? James says, yes. Is it against God's will to pray for a job? No. But is it against God's will for your job to become your God? Most certainly, yes. It's interesting because they say failing to plan is planning to fail. You ever hear that? Perhaps you've said that, use it, maybe it's written, I don't know, somewhere in your house or at your company's workplace. I think that's true of every area of life. We usually say that about business or investing, but I think it should be true of everywhere. Failing to plan, well, think about this. Holidays are around the corner. Failing to plan of what house you're going to go to and the conversations you're going to have is probably planning to fail. Get a little awkward, a little dicey. Failing to plan is planning to fail. But a lot of us, I think, have gotten into the habit of just winging it through faith. 
We'll just see where the wind blows. We'll see kind of how I feel on any given day or every single week, and we'll just kind of go with it. But how often do we have a business plan, a retirement plan, a family plan, yet do we have a kingdom plan? Do we have a 401 kingdom, one might add, when it comes to following God? We can't hope to grow the kingdom of God with based on leftovers of time. We can't hope to push forward the kingdom of God on the crumbs of finances. We can't hope to see the kingdom of God expand on the residual of relationships. But the only way to do that is to surrender everything that tries to sit on the throne of our hearts over to God himself. God says you are called to be a steward of this life. And when you are a steward of something, it means two things. It means, number one, it belongs to someone else. And number two, that the expectation is that you put it into practice by the master's wishes. Don't cling so tightly to this life that you can't be obedient to God in the midst of it all. We'll close here this morning, you know, picking up in verse seven. James says, then be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord is coming near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers or sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. He's talking about the Job of the Old Testament. And have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of uh, compassion and mercy. He's saying, look at what you learn from the prophets. Look at what you learn from the farmers. They have a patient trust in God. They work hard, they go about their day, but they also trust in what God does. And that's what we've tried to define during this series through the book of James. That's wise living. That wise living is living in God's world, God's way. And ultimately, though, that leads to following God's will. I think what James is telling us all this morning is that following God's will is a heart issue. That following God's will is not a means issue. It's not a what do I have, what do I don't have, what's gonna happen tomorrow, that following God's will for your life, that for me to follow God's will with my life, it is probably the biggest heart issue that you and I face. And James is kind of saying, the rich, well, look at them. Their hearts are more reliant on their money than they are on God. And they don't really think they have to rely on God that much because of their plans, because of their will, because of their ways. And my concern for us sometimes as American Christians is is we have so much means in this life that it can very, 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 very easily feel like we don't actually need God. You ever been there before? You ever find yourself reflecting on your relationship with Jesus to say, man, it's been a while, and I didn't even really notice. Life seemed to be going great. All the plans were coming true. Man, do I even actually need God in this life? And James is saying, hold on there, blue speck. Remember, remember, You are but a mist. So how do I know if I'm following God's will or how do I know if I'm faking it? It's simple. Are you building up the kingdom of God? If you want to ask yourself, what is God's will for my life? I'll give you the straightforward answer. Here it is. It's to build up the kingdom of God. That's it. Whether that's with your money and how you treat your employees if you have them, the responsibility to disciple and raise your children, the call to love your spouse intimately and closely, the call to love your neighbor as yourself, the call to use your spiritual gift, the call to attend your church, serve your church, grow discipled in your church, the call to to, to leverage everything that God has given you for one purpose and one purpose only. That's to build up the kingdom of God. And so the best way to seek out God, am I following your will? Just create a list of all the things you do in life and say, Have I dethroned God for this? Have I dethroned God so that this can reign a little bit more prominent in my heart or in my life? 
It could be money. You could be following Jesus so well, but you get really, really stingy and you don't give it all. It could be sex. You follow Jesus really, really well, but the call to keep yourself pure in the confines of marriage, you don't really buy that. It could be forgiveness. You follow Jesus really, really well, but you're very slow to forgive those who have hurt you. There's probably something. And the hard part is as soon as we dethrone something and we give it over to God, something else tries to sneak its way back up, doesn't it? That's why Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. Living obediently to Jesus, it transforms everything. Not just some things. Not just the Sunday things, not just the faith things, Following Jesus obediently transforms everything for the sake of this, for the sake of eternity. So let me close here this morning. What might Jesus be trying to transform in your life here so that it could build up his kingdom and his eternity here? God is more concerned about his will in your life than he is about your will for your own. Would you stand with me as we pray and we continue to worship God this morning? Let's stand and pray together here. Heavenly Father, we lift up your name, your power in spirit and in truth. God, may the goodness of your word, may the goodness and the power of your spirit direct our paths, guide our ways. Lord, life is, is, is not easy, but it is short. In the grand scheme of eternity, Lord, we know and we want to trust your way above all else. Give us the humility, give us the passion, give us the obedience to chase after you above all else. Reveal to us the things that are king of our heart that might be dethroned so that you, Lord, may reign above it all. It's dream that we pray. Amen.